Welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof? Hi, Hello. Martin. Hello, Walter. I'm glad you have a little bit of a voice now. A little bit. It's not quite there yet. Yeah. So please bear with my voice and we'll see how it goes. We'll get the Lord. We'll trust the Lord to raise you up. It's coming. It's coming right. It's coming right. It's been a bit of a slog, but it's coming right. Ah. Let's open the wor with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for helping us to carry on. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to do these discussions and thank you for giving us the strength. Please be with us now as we present this and let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Martin, we spoke about many things in the last one. And uh, our little discussion on the Apocrypha created a bit of a hornet's nest. No, I didn't expect that quite so seriously. but yeah. Well, tell us what happened. Well, a lot of uh, some comments that we received um, stated that we did not distinguish between the Old Testament Apocrypha and the New Testament Apocrypha. You see, the Old Testament Apocrypha were also included in the original King James, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the Protestants came to their senses and removed them. Correct. And I don't think it was in any case when it was in the King James, even then, seen as in inspired scripture. Except in the Catholic Church. That right? is where the, the Roman Catholic in. Church states canonically that they must be seen canonically. And if you don't see it that way, you're an anathema. That, that's a, a little bit of a problem for pe people that's continuously trying to um, uplift the Apocrypha. Martin, if the beast of Revelation is determined to put something in, that backs some of its doctrines but is contrary to the rest of Scripture, then you should be very suspicious. Why go down that road? Why go down that road? And if I remember correctly, in that episode, I also mentioned that if you want to know more of what happened, for instance, in the Old Testament times with Israel, you can read Patriarchs and Prophets. So that will already have given you a clue that we did include the Old Testament uh, Apocrypha in this whole discussion. But for clarity's sake, I thought, okay, maybe let's just look at some of these books of the Old Testament Apocrypha and see what it states, and then we can see if it's in harmony with Scripture. Well, let me put it quite plainly. The New Testament Apocrypha are a load of rubbish. Yeah. And uh, if somebody didn't get it, they're a load of rubbish because they contain absolute, irrational, illogical, unscientific mm -hmm. and biblical and biblical nonsense yes. but uh, some of them are written so so nicely like the book of Enoch for example that I get the way with it with contradicting scripture and just being enough in line and giving information that sounds so interesting mm. but really is irrelevant to your salvation true true and then I read that you know some people are upset because of the cycle of the week. Mm. But I read in Ellen G. White that uh, God marvelously preserved the cycle of the week from the beginning. Yet. She saw that. And if she saw that, and people say, but he didn't do it, well, then God is either incapable or she's a false prophet. One of the two. One of the two. I also had the discussion because if... God changed, uh, if the cycle was changed, God rectified it, like we've mentioned many times before, with the manna. Many, many instances we've dealt so with it. But finished. let's go to these things and see what this is about before we get to our topic. Martin, my voice is not quite there yet, so I'm going to appoint you as the reader. I'll try my best. <laughs> let's see what's going on here. All right, so this is in the book of Tobit. The traveling companion of... Okay, so this is a description of what's going on in, the, in this book. And let's see what we can glean from this. The traveling companion of Tobias on his journey was the angel Raphael, although his identity was unknown to either Tobit or Tobias. On the way to Media, when he was bathing, Tobias was attacked by a large fish. The fish was killed. Raphael then told Tobias to remove the heart and lung from the fish because it would make useful medicine. 
at the same time, Tobit was asking the Lord to take his life. There was a woman in media named Sarah who was also requesting to die. She had lost seven husbands, each on the night of their honeymoon. A demon named Asmodeus had entered into their bedchamber and killed each one of these men. Thus Sarah wished to die. Then Tobias arrived in Media. He was urged by Raphael to marry Sarah. Instead of becoming the eighth victim of the demon, Tobias used the liver and heart of the dead fish to drive the demon from the bedchamber. When Tobias and Sarah returned to Nineveh, he used part of the fish to rub onto the eyes of his blind father. At that moment, Tobit was cured from his blindness. Raphael then revealed his true identity to Tobit. He was an angel sent by God to answer Tobit's prayer. There are a number of obvious historical and geographical errors in this book that make it historically impossible. As noted, legendary elements are also found in this story. So that's the commentary of the writer here. Martin, if this book is inspired, then I've lost all respect for inspiration. This book has got magic in it as well, it seems to me. This fish, muti, that you have to do, then the Shangomas in Africa seems to be doing quite well. Yes. So we don't need Jesus. Jesus is the one who drives out demons. He's the only one who can. Even Gabriel required the assistance of Michael. Mm. So Martin, if people want to be gallbladder and heart addicts of fish, they won't come to it. They can go and catch as many fish as they like, cut out the gallbladders and the hearts, and go like priests and put them in a little bottle with perhaps a little bit of smoke and drive out all the demons. If they really think that that stupidity will work, they're quite welcome. As far as I'm concerned, this book has nothing to do with Scripture mm. and it has no place in Scripture. And if the Roman Catholics like it because they like hocus pocus, then that's their problem. Correct. So people can judge for themselves. Read it. So let's see another book. The book of Judith. So Judith is the account of a Jewish woman who saves her people by killing an enemy leader. There does not seem to be a historical basis for this story. The book contains a number of historical and chronological errors. In fact, Judith begins with a couple of obvious historical errors. It says, It was the twelfth year of reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled over the Assyrians in the great city of Nineveh. In those days, Arphaxad ruled over the Medes in Ekbatana. That's in Judith 1 verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of the Babylonians, not the Assyrians. Furthermore, he ruled in Babylon, not Nineveh. These are grave historical errors that show the legendary character of this book. In fact, the New American Bible, a Roman Catholic translation, makes the following admission concerning the book of Judith. Any attempt to read this book directly against the backdrop of Jewish history in relation to the empires of the world is bound to fail. Prologue to Judith. What this simply means is that the entire account of the book of Judith is fictional. There is a more serious problem. According to the book of Judith, God assists Judith in telling a number of lies. Judith lies to the Assyrians by saying that she is hiding from her people. Once she has gained their trust, she is able to kill their leader by her deceit. Well, I think, I, leave it at that. I what more do you want to say, Martin? I don't want to say anything. I think people must judge for themselves. So do you want to take uh, the book of Judith rather than the book of Kings as your reference? There you go. Do you want to replace the book of Esther with Judith? No. I, I think uh, people can judge for themselves on this one. Let's go to another book. Okay, this book is Bell and the Dragon, Bell and, or Bell and the Snake. It consists of two stories. These two accounts ridicule idolatry and show how the gods of Babylon are without power. Okay. In the second story, Daniel asked permission of the king to kill the dragon they were worshipping. He said, But give me permission, O king, and I will kill the dragon without sword or club. The king said, I give you permission. Then Daniel took pitch, fat and hair and boiled them together and made cakes which he fed to the dragon. The dragon ate them and burst open. Then Daniel said, See what you have been worshipping? 
The Babylonians then became upset because Daniel had destroyed two of their idols. They convinced the king to throw Daniel into a den of lions. The story concludes by showing that God protected Daniel from the lions during the six days that he was in the den. On the seventh day, the king arrived at the lion's den to find Daniel safe. Bell and the dragon is added to the book of Daniel as Daniel chapter 14 in Roman Catholic translations and as a separate work in Protestant translations. Drivel. So you actually got two versions of the story of Daniel and the, lion, uh, Daniel and the lions. And the, in the biblical one, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den Why? because he follows true worship. Mm -hmm. Here there's a lot of hocus pocus mm -hmm. and nonsense. Well, if you want to believe that, you're quite welcome. But this isn't uh, gel with the rest of the Bible. No. So why do you want these books to be canonical? Because they support hocus pocus? No. I don't know, but it's up to you, the reader, and to the listener himself to and decide. And do you really think that the dragon would burst open from a cake of pitch, fat, and hair? Sounds like a tasty morsel. Why would he eat it in the first place? <laughs> oh, no. Let's have a look at another book. The book of Second Maccabees. Uh, now, Before you go to yeah. Maccabees, Martin, these are historical books, yes. right? And I've always maintained, if you want to read them as an addendum, then we're fine. But uh, it's like adding the Encyclopedia Britannica and saying, read this as an addendum to the Bible. No, they, they can put Josephus also in there. Correct, and say that their history is more accurate than that recorded in the Bible. If you believe that the Bible is an inspired book, then the other books must be judged by what is written in the Bible and not the Bible judged by what is written in other books. That's it. So if you want an additional historical source, then use one that is inspired. So if you want to study the Old Testament, we've always quite plainly said, read patriarchs and prophets and prophets and kings and then you have one that is in harmony and expandery if you like on what is happening in the bible and even it explains very well um on enoch well interesting also is a lot of people say okay but jude refers to enoch and there's a lot of verses that refers to enoch my question once again is the book of Enoch is not in harmony with the Bible. So then the, the reference cannot be to that book. Well, Martin, let's just read that passage in the Bible. Let's do that. In the book of Jude, in verse 14, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. Hmm. Let's just stop right there. What Enoch is he referring to? The godly one. The, the godly one. The one that walked with God. Correct. The seventh from Adam. Because the other Enoch was the son of Cain. Mm. He came before this Adam. Yeah. Now we have clearly shown in many lectures, and you can derive it from Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, that Freemasonry derives its wisdom from Enoch, son of Cain. Mm because the chronology that he uses cannot refer to the good Enoch. It can only refer to the evil Enoch, son of Cain. Mm -hmm. Now that religion of the evil Enoch came through and went all the way through via probably Ham to Nimrod and spread on. So the religion of Freemasonry, which is Luciferian, traces its line from Enoch. Mm. So when you have uh, the deities that you have, they refer to Cain and to Enoch. So Marduk will be Enoch, mm. for example. Now, this one is referring to Enoch as the seventh from Adam. And this one was taken to heaven without seeing death. Mm. Now surely Enoch must have prophesied about the coming of the Lord. He definitely. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these 
saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Martin, is, is there anything in there that contradicts Scripture? No, it's 100% in, in, in line with, and obviously the Enoch that walked with God would say everything in harmony with Scripture. Why would you want to go into a deep theological discussion about the book of Enoch now? And uh, Peter... Mm -hmm is the one who came in support of of Jude because even then he must have received some flack the, true. and he repeated many of the things without mentioning the book of Enoch at all at all and that's the thing and just once more the book of Enoch contradicts the bible so it cannot be the book by the true Enoch let's, let's leave, leave it. it at that all right, so here we have a historic book, but let's see what additional little tidbits there can ap appear in an historic book. Exactly. Right, let's read this. So let's see, in 2 Maccabees, it's not as historically accurate as 1 Maccabees. It has several chronological errors and also contains a number of contradictions as well as some fanciful and legendary material. The final section, chapter 10, relates the successful military campaign of Judas Maccabeus and the defeat of Nicanor. As mentioned, much of this material is unhistorical. Roman Catholic doctrine such as purgatory, prayers for the dead and the intercessory work of glorified saints find support in 2 Maccabees. Can you see why the Roman Catholic Church wants them to be canonical? Of course. Because it supports their doctrine. Now, the doctrine of purgatory is essential to them mm. because they don't have salvation in Christ. They deny the atonement, remember? And therefore, they have to purge their own sins. That's it. And that's why they need a purgatory. But I don't need a purgatory. I have Christ. That's the thing. So these books, you know what these books make me think of? It's like that series, The Chosen. You can watch it, but there's no biblical foundation for that. No, and no. the writers of it acknowledges it. And they're using make-believe. They're making the stories up. You know, if it's not biblical, and it takes you on a tangent and puts you into another frame of mind, no matter how wooey-wooey it is, I'm not interested. I there's no time for this anymore. Study the Bible in the spirit of prophecy and get the three angels' message out to people. And throw this nonsense out. Yeah. Martin, the danger is, once you start using extraneous sources, it opens the way for spurious doctrines. Yeah. Like purgatory, for example, which is a key, a key doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. It lays the basis for an entire false pagan religion that is based on your own salvation through your own works. Right? Yes. Once you start opening the door to that, then you might as well start opening the door to let the Spirit lead. That's the truth. That's exactly. And once you start that doctrine, let the Spirit lead, then you can redefine love. Okay. Then love means anything. Yeah, so if you love trees, you can marry a tree. Mm -hmm. Let's not go into all the other perversions that come along the line. No. And then in the, in the end, as long as you have redefined it as love, then anything goes. Mm. But let's leave doctrine aside. Opening the door. Mm-hmm. To false doctrine leads to a floodgate of woe. Oh, for sure. Do you know what's interesting is that this is Roman Catholic driven. That means it's Antichrist driven. Yes. So if you dangle in this and you study this and you become an expert in this, you might just end up like Henry Newman did and become a cardinal in the Antichrist system. You might as well become a cardinal. 
Now, we must never forget that Rome is a brilliant system because it can accommodate two classes. Oh, yeah. And the two classes that it accommodates is those that want to be saved by their works and those that want to be saved in their sins. sins. And they are masters at incorporating them both. So when you look at the Roman Catholic system and you look at the Roman Catholic cardinals, taking part in gay parades, mm. propagating abortion, and the other lot shouting against it. It looks like total confusion. Yeah. But it, and you have the ultra-conservatives, those that want to be saved by their works and those that want to be saved in their sins. Both classes are welcome. Incredible. No wonder the door is so broad and so wide. It is, and we've shown me numerous times that even other religions are accepted in, in the Roman Catholic system. Now, how far is this going to go? Let's see how it's spreading over into the Protestant churches. Well, Concept. Martin, read this for us and tell us what's going on here. So there was an interesting article about a Lutheran church, a community Lutheran church, that had a support for the this Pride Month that was happening, all this woke... Um, and they called it a Sparkle Creed. Yes, that was read in the church. So we don't have to read the article, we can actually watch the video. Okay. Well, this was an interesting article and actually a video that went viral about a Lutheran church that had a la the preacher, the lady, read the Sparkle Creed. But now we have to find out what the Sparkle Creed is. Let's read there in the second paragraph. The Sparkle Creed is a version of the Apostles' Creed modified to include the LGBTQ plus community. The incident took place on Sunday, June 25, with co-pastor Anna Helgen leading the congregation. She recites that God is non-binary, that Jesus Christ had two dads, and that love is love. Calling for inclusion and diversity, she adds, I believe in the church of everyday saints, as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the AIDS quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. Now, Martin, our church has consistently, from its inception, resisted a creed. Yes. Because once you have a creed, then you have actually created a set of rules and understandings of what you believe in the Bible, and you now exclude the Holy Spirit from further uh, advising you as to what the Word is actually saying. So we have no creed but the Bible. Mm -hmm. So the Bible is our creed. And... Uh, once you start going down this road, eventually anything goes. And you can bring idols in, you can do whatever you like, mm -hmm. because it's defined in within your framework. And you can call it a sparkle creed. You know what? And it's also dangerous, because even if you start going to the official position of the church, that can always also start creeping to... Towards yeah. the secular way of thinking. Yes, and Bible set aside. Especially when it comes to issues of health or whatever. Mm. Whatever the government says can become mm, the church. thought pattern of the church. No, church policy. Can become church policy. Mm. And church policy might not be biblical policy. Exactly. So we have no creed but the Bible. So let's have a look at this video of what she said. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and let us confess our faith today in the words of the Sparkle Creed. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the ace quilt whose feet are grounded in mud 
and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love. So beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. Martin, do you have to now redefine Jesus? <laughs> they, they definitely did. So they redefine him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who should define Jesus for you? The Bible. The Bible? God. Yes. Himself. I listened to a preacher the other day, and I, I was quite pleased with him and quite amused at him. He says, if you want to know what God says, then read your Bible. And if you want to hear what God says, then read it loud. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. True. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's the way it should be, and nothing else. No, that's true. So this it just shows you, it goes from, like you always said, it's going from the ridiculous to the total sublime. <laughs> well, if society has gone totally mad, then it's good news because it tells us where we are in the stream of time. That's true. Let's watch this one. How far is the world going? Let's talk about Miss Netherlands. So at the weekend, Ricky Valerie uh, Coley, who was a transgender entrant to Miss Netherlands competition, uh, won the title. So a biological male has been voted Miss Netherlands and will now take part in Miss Universe. Michaela, your thoughts? I hope he wins Miss Universe. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It, it's, I don't even know how to react to these situations because women fought so hard to get where we are today. I was just looking at uh, the picture of the Boston Marathon runner mm. in 1967, and it's this woman, and she's being grabbed by men on the track because women weren't allowed to compete. That's where it started. And now we're here, and there are men competing in our sports, and I have no idea how feminism came it is. It is. Way. It's so bizarre. And Kat, I mean, only yesterday, Megan Rapino, one of the great female sports stars in American history, came out on as she retires, which might be convenient timing because it won't apply to her, and said, "I'd be very happy if trans mm. athlete sports women come and play in the American women's team." Well, fine, but what happens if they're all eleven biological males representing the American women's team? I mean, this can't be right, surely. So he's got a very good. He's got a very good point, actually, in that last last statement. What if all of the uh, the, the girls on the team is biological males? So, well, let's change the football teams and make all the males biological females. So, wouldn't yeah. that be interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what is the devil, yeah. Martin? Oh, the master it, of reversal. reversal. So, what does he hate? Yeah, it's everything that God's put in place, and he hates. Two institutions in particular, two that were blessed in Eden, mm -hmm. marriage and the Sabbath. And the Sabbath. And those are the two that he's going to attack, come hell or high water. That's it. And he's doing a pretty good job. Oh, yes. But the laughing stock is actually humanity is going along with it. Yeah. Just shows you how gullible they can be. That's it. Great. So, Martin. When it comes to the Sabbath, that's the next point of attack and the last one because it attacks the authority of God, right? Yeah, that's it. And Bonnie Prince, oh, no, sorry, King. Bonnie King Charles. <laughs> <laughs> he is the climate activist and uh, he believes everything that Al Gore believes, yeah. that nobody else in the world that has any sense believes. But let's leave it at that. They got a buddy, the, ch the climate czar of um, the United States, John Kerry, as well. Yes, and a, and a boss star, which is the Pope himself. That's it. Now, let's see what they're going to do about this climate issue, because it has to be driven to a point now. Yeah, everywhere we, s we'll, we see this is becoming climate madness. And we're just reading about heat waves, and I read now the other day that the tar on the roads is melting oh. from the terrible heat. Now, Martin, when I was a kid mm -hmm. in Cape Town, on a hot day, the tar melted on the road. We used to play with it. Yeah. So, you know what? They're making such hype 
of things that have been taking place on this earth for ever. That's it. So let's see what this is all about. One. King Charles helped turn on a climate clock at a summit in London this afternoon. It triggers 150 similar clocks across the major cities of the UK, counting down the seconds to 2030. The estimated deadline for limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Notice they use a dial clock mechanism, like a compass almost like a flat earth Mazaroth type of clock there. Keep that in mind when you watch this, which opens today. Hitler made mistakes, and with this, I will correct them all. Hitler made mistakes, and with this dial of destiny, I will correct them all. Interesting statement considering what we're witnessing now in the world. I wonder what mistakes Hitler made he's referring to. And this whole trailer starts off with a very familiar tune called Sympathy for the Devil. I'm retiring. So they start this doomsday dial climate clock the very same day that the dial of destiny opens. And of course the trailer is dubbed over with sympathy for the devil. Well, Martin, we've been saying it's a Luciferian agenda for a long time. And uh, the drivers and the movers and the shakers of the Luciferian agenda are the Jesuits. Yes. Whether they like it or not, finished. they're the Jesuits because they hate the Bible, mm. that poisonous asp. And uh, they're the ones in Jesuit theater. They're running the whole show. And historically, the crown has been ceded to Rome. That's it. So it sits on Bonnie King Charles's head by the grace of Rome. That's it. And uh, he serves the dragon. And the dragon is a symbol of Rome. So, you know, we have all of these interesting things. And then you have their, their skull and bones masters. Mm -hmm. All of these puppeteers and puppets are all on the same bandwagon. And they're leading towards one thing. Climate lockdowns and climate rest days. Yeah. Namely, Sundays. It will. It's coming. So let's have a look at what what uh, Fox News has to say about John Kerry. It's interesting they call him the climate czar. Mm. But whose tune is he playing? The Vatican. He's the playing the Vatican's tune. So he's playing the Vatican's drum. So he's actually the Vatican drummer. He is very good because remember that video we've shown it a few times already where he says that the Pope is the moral leader of the... Of, of the, the entire world. world, yes. So let these bonesmen throw their bones. Have a look. <laughs> John Kerry has a new climate target. Farmers. Ashley, I know all about this story, but why don't you explain it to our viewers? I'll try. Our fearless climate czar, who jets around the world, by the way, in his private aircraft, taking aim now at farmers because they're polluting the environment, he says. Mr. Kerry claims agriculture production creates 33% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions, and the fight against climate change cannot be tackled without addressing what the farmers are doing. In fact, Kerry is refusing to call it climate change anymore. He says it's climate crisis. And Kerry says emissions from the food system alone are projected to cause another half a degree of warming by the year 2050. The former Secretary of State says lives depend on world leaders and scientists developing the tools necessary to lower agriculture emissions. It's all about the cows. Danas raspravljamo o ulozi vas poljoprivrednika u zelenoj tranziciji. Vaša uloga je iznimno jednostavna. Vi morate nestati. Zašto? Zato jer smetate novoj suludoj ideologiji potpune kontrole na stanovništvo Mreovske unije, za koje će u skorijoj budućnosti jedina hrana biti umjetno stvorena hrana, 
nadopunjena uvezenim kukcima sa istoka. Normalnu biohranu moći će kupovati i jesti isključivo bogati. Rat protiv poljoprivrednika je započeo u Nizuzemskoj. Tamo se farmerima temeljem zakona želi oduzeti njihovo zemljište i predati u ruke građevinskom sektoru, jer je navodno poljoprivredna opasna po zemljište i stanovništvo. Oni se ne daju tako se neće dati ni poljoprivrednici u Hrvatskoj i drugim zemljama Europske unije. Hvala. Well, Martin, agriculture has to go. They're fighting against the Bible because the Bible says seed time and harvest will not pass. Interesting that the spirit of prophecy also tells us to secure for ourselves a piece of land where we can grow our own uh, produce and all of this. Uh, what's the situation of South Africa and farmers? They want to get you off. Yes. That, so it, the devil is making it increasingly difficult to do what the Bible and spirit of prophecy is telling us to do. Correct. So this is part of the agenda of buying and selling, of total control. That's actually what he says. It's all about control. Mm -hmm. And they're also going after the appliances. Mm -hmm. And I see that Biden has just... Uh, said that he wants to up the game there so your gas stove and all of these things will have to go because they're contributing to the tar melting on a hot summer's day as it has been melting for the last hundreds of years but let's leave it at that but martin let's look at this ludicrous stuff that they are doing but always remember that you're looking at, at it from a biblical perspective so no matter how ludicrous it looks, no matter how excited you get about it, no matter how angry you want to get about it, it's part of the prophecy of where we are heading. Mm -hmm. So let's embrace it. That's it. Not embrace it in the sense of support it, no. but embrace it in terms of warning humanity as to where we are going. That's it. Yeah, well, you mentioned now that they want to stop gas and all of this in London. It's also uh, very serious at this stage. No fires, uh, uh, wood fires, no gas, stoves, and 20 mile an hour <laughs> speed limits. It's going to be interesting and fun to watch how they're going to implement that in Africa <laughs> by telling people not to burn wood anymore uh, you know, and destroying the lifeline I, of the whole African continent. It will be interesting. It will be interesting. <laughs> Let's see what happens. You know they what? got them to wear masks in the middle of nowhere, which has served absolutely no purpose, are totally ridiculous, but nevertheless... We will see how many people go along with this thing. Yes. But yeah, well, in, now we've got Nigel Farage that will tell us a little bit more what, what's happening in the... We're going to go UK. for climate lockdowns, and climate lockdowns are going to lead to Sunday legislation. That's it. Let's watch. Could climate lockdowns be on the horizon? According to Nigel Farage, the answer is yes. And then this Tuesday, Mayor Khan says, the air quality in London today is going to be poor. And that's because summer has finally arrived on our little island. All right? So he says, please don't use your car unless it's absolutely necessary. Do not let your car idle. Do not burn wood, and so on and so forth. Now, if I'd said to you four years ago, that we'd be locked down because of a flu-like virus that had come from China, you would not on this program have believed me. And I'm telling you here and now that in the name of climate change, in the name of pollution, we will, certainly in London, within the next few years, have a period when the mayor says, you must not use your car at all, and air quality is so bad, you must stay at home. This isn't about pollution. Nope. It isn't about climate change. It's about controlling our lives. We're becoming like China. And don't think it won't come to you because it will. It's the same panic peddling and the same hysteria hustling that they used to frighten people into silence and compliance during COVID. Fear equals control and control equals power and nobody should buy it. The way fear was used during the lockdown was extraordinary. 
you know, millions of our elderly people shut themselves in their homes, shut themselves off from their kids, their grandkids, from their neighbours, their friends, uh, because government advertisements were telling them, if you leave your front door, you might die. They did it with COVID, and they'll do it with climate, and they'll do it with pollution. And the worrying thing about this is how few so-called conservative politicians and commentators are prepared to stand up to it. Yep. That's the thing that really worries me the most. You know, it's, it's fascinating. You have people that are born free that are so willing to give up their freedoms, um, to accept mandates that are crazy at drive 20 miles an hour. Maybe want, they want you to ride a little scooter bike. Um, more people have to stand up to this. And he's right. Parties have to push back on these crazy environmentalists. It's because those conservatives who won't stand up are part of the elite. Ah. That's why, because those the rules don't apply to them. It's all, you know, it's a big club. It is. Now, you will have seen various scare stories uh, about, oh, there's a new pandemic coming. The next one's going to be worse. This sort of stuff. You will have read about that. What you won't have read much about is how the World Health Organization, I've warned you about this many, many times before on this show, uh, are desperate to have some kind of global pandemic treaty whereby it would be the World Health Organization who says to separate countries that the World Health Organization will have the powers to be able to say such and such a state or such and such a nation or country or whatever is in a pandemic situation and must be locked down, even if that entity says, no, we're not, or disputes it. That's the fear of how bad it could be. There's dispute about whether that's what the agenda will be. And so many things that we need to be vigilant about and what people need to be vigilant about, but they get called conspiracy theorists and whack jobs and things like that. The fundamental idea behind all of this is this idea that freedom is somehow the problem. And this <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> is the issue with so many of the issues that we face, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's the climate crisis, if you want to say that in quotes, whatever the issue is. People having too much freedom is the thing that annoys the regulators. And we're going to see this. Um, we saw the Climate Council this week come out and say that, well, to you know, <clears throat> fight the climate thing, not only do we need to all move to EVs, but we need to own half as many cars yeah. and take half as many car trips. We need to take trips according to the public transport schedule. You know, yeah. We see this on level after level after level. And this is what people need to be really vigilant about. It is not freedom that is the problem it no, is always exactly. the people who want to take your freedom away and we're now in a world where really it's not left versus right it's authoritarianism versus freedom as james says or the collective the greater good versus mm -hmm. freedom of the individual to make their own choices and what we saw during COVID, which is why we must have a royal commission as rita was saying to find out what actually happened during COVID. here here we must have that royal commission into what actually happened and what did happen to our freedoms and at what cost they came it's therefore with great hope that I declare COVID-19 over as a global health emergency. However, that does not mean COVID-19 is over as a global health threat. Last week, COVID-19 claimed life every three minutes. And that's just the deaths we know about. As we speak, Thousands of people around the world are fighting for their lives in intensive care units. And millions more continue to live with the debilitating effects of post-COVID-19 condition. This virus is here to stay. Martin, let's just make something quite plain again. They're all looking for the enemy. The enemy is some vague power out there that wants to take away your, your freedom. freedom. The only organization that really wants to take away your freedom and regain its original power is the beast of revelation. That's it. So if people would do a little bit of research and look at all the movers and shakers in, in governments, in whatever sphere, because they're all involved, mm. whether it's sport, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We'll talk about whether that. it's sport, we must talk about sport. Whether it's sport, whether it's the health world, whether it's the banking cartels, mm -hmm. whether it's big business, whether it's government, whether it's United Nations, who are the movers and shakers? Have a look. What is their pedigree? Mm -hmm. You will find they either belong to the Knights of Malta, they're either Knights of Malta, or they belong to Opus Dei, 
or they are Jesuits, mm -hmm. and they get rewarded by the Jesuits. You take Fauci for example. Oh yeah. Didn't he? Wasn't he just made superb, wonderful professor mm. at Georgetown yeah. for a work wonderfully done? Exactly. Ooh, when everybody says what he did was totally ridiculous, mm. but he gets rewarded. Yeah, yeah. Right. By whom? By, by whom? <laughs> All right. Now, if you're a knight, then you are in a military order, and you take orders. We've said this before. Mm. Who do you take orders from? You take orders from your general. That's it. Now, where is the general of the Knights of Malta and who do they <laughs> swear allegiance to? They swear allegiance to the Pope. Mm -hmm. But they take the orders from a general. Yeah. Right? Mm. Who happens to be the Black Pope. Black Pope. Okay. And if you look at the kings of the world, including Bonnie King Charles... <laughs> Doesn't he wear a Maltese cross? Yes. So he's, a, he's associated with the Order of Malta. Mm -hmm. And the Order of Malta is a military order that is subject to the Pope. The same with the Order of the Bath. Whatever All order they want to. They can wear their garters. They can <laughs> do whatever they want to talk. They can sit in their little meetings and, uh, you know, whether they are the Bilderbergers or whether they are the whatever. The bottom line is... Who started the Bilderbergers? Yeah. Wasn't it Joseph Rettinger, a Jesuit? Yeah. So behind all of these things sits the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And if people don't want to see it, they are blind. Yeah. Who, like you mentioned before, how they ruled for 1,260 years. They ruled this earth. And they want to rule it again. That's it. And what do they have to do in order to do that? They have to bludgeon you into submission mm. and you have to accept their mark and you have to accept their doctrine and you have to wonder and think like them i refuse to wonder and think like them and i will not accept their mark for sure but they are determined to do that the bible says they will control banking because you won't be able to buy or sell no. they will be able to control whatever you do mm. so the next point is can they spike into your banking accounts and do whatever they want. Yeah, so what? look at what some of these news anchors or some people, you can see that they see there's something wrong here. But they don't know what it is. And they don't know who, like you said, they're looking at the pawn. Yes. The bottom guy who they think is the elite. But this elite is answering <laughs> to the system. Exactly. Now, this Nigel Farage... The, the article that we've got here is about him, his bank being closed, his bank account. They closed his bank account, yes, yeah. because he spoke up on national television. Martin, is your bank account secure? No, it cannot be, <laughs> never. <laughs> All right, let's read then to us what it says there. Yeah, the terrifying rise of debanking. Last week, former Brexit party leader Nigel Farage announced that his Scout's bank account of over 40 years has been closed against his will and without any real explanation. The motive might have been political, he speculated. Perhaps Couts, the prestigious private bank for the wealthy, had taken exception to his support for Brexit. Farage went on to claim that nine other banks have refused his custom too. This seemed like a potential case of what has become known as debanking, that is, the practice of withholding bank services to individuals because of the views they hold. Let's hold it right there. Yeah. Is that what the Bible says what's going to happen? Exactly. Exactly what's going to happen. Can they do it? They're already doing it. Now, whose tune are the banks dancing to? <laughs> They're going back to the Vatican. They're dancing to the Vatican tune because the Vatican controls them. Is it so? The Vatican is also pro-climate change. All of this comes together. If you together. are against it, you might be in trouble. So, read on. As it stands, we do not know exactly why Farage's account was closed, but we do know that he is not the only one claiming to have been debanked. In fact, over the past week or so, numerous cases have emerged of people being denied access to financial services, seemingly on the basis of their political views. This has included activists, parents' groups, and even people with no political background at all. All right. 
it's always our motive to show that we're heading towards the fulfillment of prophecy. And I wish people would would understand where we are in the stream of time. It's serious. It's very serious. And it cannot go on for much longer. In fact, I hope it does not go no. on for much longer because I can't stand the idiocy anymore. <laughs> it's true because people are so gullible and just being swept into this flood of lies. Into the flood of lies. And uh, who was the father of lies? Huh. Satan. And the Bible says truth has been thrown to the ground. It's true. So, Martin, let's hear what the mayor of New York has to say. This is a significant moment, and we're going to look back on what we're doing here in New York and what we're doing in London and how this impacts the way we have been thinking. And it also is going to be in, in an uncomfortable moment uh, for many. Uh, it is easy to talk about uh, emissions that are coming from vehicles and how it impacts our carbon footprint. It is easy to talk about the emissions that's coming from buildings and how it impacts our environment. Uh, but we now have to talk about beef. And I don't know if people are really ready for this conversation. And we can't have a level of hypocrisy where we want to ensure that we do local laws to address the emissions that's come from uh, fossil fuel, but not willing to have a real conversation on what food is doing to us. And today we are saying to New Yorkers and really to the globe that it impacts our planet. I always say we have two mothers. One gives birth to us, the other sustains us, and we have been destroying the one that sustains us uh, based on the food that we have been consuming. We are leading the world in ensuring we combat climate change. And if we're going to accomplish this goal, it must be accomplished by being honest. You cannot leave the third leading cause of climate change unacknowledged. And when you do a comparison, the numbers that food contributes compared to transportation, they are extremely close. It's almost a dead even. So we can't talk about cars, we can't talk about buildings, if we're not talking about the food that also contributed to this crisis. Today, we are saying to New Yorkers who are serious about this charge of cleaning up our environment, we now have a new focus that is also must include food. Is that in line with biblical prophecy? Yes. So everything is there. If everything is falling into, well, it has been falling into place for quite a few years already. By the way, I don't have two mothers. I had one. <laughs> one mother. Isn't it crazy? You've got those other people that say Jesus had two dads. Now you've got a new mother as well. <laughs> the only one who has two dads is me. <laughs> I have an earthly father and I have a heavenly father. But as for two mothers, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> now some of these things are discussed in meetings where not everybody attends and nobody even hears about it, but the movers and the shakers make decisions. Now, this Congress lady attended one of these meetings and she's going to give a report. And she's quite alarmed at what was stated there, but nothing was ever said in the media. True. I mean, we, we heard earlier about uh, on that news, um, Austra Sky News Australia, that he mentioned this World Health Organization treaty. We've mentioned it before, but let's hear what it actually entails. Congresswoman Bachman, tell us a little bit about what you experienced when you went to Geneva, Switzerland, and were a part of at least the uh, audience listening to all the things going on at the World Health Organization. And this is, has such profound consequences for every person on earth. Because the plan envisioned is that every person on earth would come under the dominion and control of the World Health Organization. It was just Monday of this week, one week after the World Health Assembly concluded that there was a, an actual absolute bombshell press, uh, a press letter that went out that said the European Union has already developed a global digital passport that would regulate 
um, the ability of people to take transportation, and it would also regulate our health issues. That global digital passport, which essentially would be a QR code on your mobile phone, the, an individual would have to be in compliance with the mandates of the World Health Organization in order to be able to travel, in right. order to be able to move about. So yeah. this was announced on Monday. They didn't wait to pass amendments or pass a global treaty. They announced that the World Health Organization is adopting what Europe came up with that already covers 80 countries out of the 194. The question is, when will the United States go into this system? Because this is how you enforce global government through this global digital passport. It is a reality. And Monday it was announced that the WHO will take over the European uh, digital passport. And they also stated this will be the first building block, presumably merging digital currency, digital health records, our entire life will eventually be merged onto this digital QR code. And they said the effective date is June of 2023. In other words, right now, this yes. global digital passport is effective now. It won't be a year from now. Our lives will be completely upended, absent a miracle or an intervening hand from the Lord. We're looking at, at less than a year at this point of having this full digital passport enforced and actually um, out in play for everyone in the world. So they, it's envisioned, it's created, it's a matter of getting everyone on board. And when you look at the 307 proposed amendments to the international health rules and the global pandemic treaty, both of them um, mandate compliance by member states. They talk about how they member, they mandate compliance, but they also talk about how uh, they have committees to stop anybody from talking about this. And it's really shocking when you think the mainstream media hasn't talked about this, the cable media hasn't, the social media hasn't been talking about this. And yet, through alternative media sources like yourselves, really oh, more than half of the people don't trust the system. They know something about this just through alternative media. That's why the, the global amendments and the pandemic treaty envision shutting down even alternative media. Everyone has to be in compliance with the message given out by global government. And that will be within the year that they'll start on these restrictions on speech. And so that's why use, use our speech as long as we can. Martin, use our speech as long as we can. And uh, time frame. We have lots of time, right? Uh. Mm. <laughs> it's, already, it's already in. All right. So if we don't have time, then shouldn't we make double efforts, triple efforts yeah. to get the message out? Definitely. We I don't think there's much time left for public evangelism. No. No, no, no. Also not media. Well, I doubt if anything is going to last long uh, to get the message out, on, like on these platforms. All right. In the Middle Ages, mm. did the Roman Catholic Church tolerate dissent? No, not one bit. Who came and fetched you? The Inquisition. Mm -hmm. All right, so there was no dissent. Did they control every aspect? Every single aspect of life was controlled. All right, so they're control freaks par excellence. Mm -hmm. Martin, this system is a counterfeit system. It is a system that counterfeits the true government of God. The difference is that God's government is based on agapeo. Mm. Agape is selfless love. Mm. Theirs is based on their leader, who was a liar from the beginning and a murderer, and is selfishness personified. Mm -hmm. So the two systems have control. Mm -hmm. The two systems require obedience. God requires obedience. Mm -hmm. And he says, if you do not keep my law, you will die. God requires absolute obedience. True. But the basis 
for the requirement of the obedience is love. Is love. The other one also requires absolute obedience. Mm -hmm. Has God's system got a, a right arm? Yes. It has a health message. Health message, yes. Does the other system have a health message? Yes. Uh, is God ever going to force you? No. Is the other system going to force you? Yes. Is God's system right? Yes. Because God knows what he do, does, right? And he, he implemented it and he designed us. And he's doing it for our best. Yes. All right. So the beast wants absolute control. The beast wants worship. Yes. Now, if he cannot change your heart to worship you, he must change your behavior True. to worship him. Yeah. And if he gets you to obey him, even though your heart's not right, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, matter because whom you obey, you are actually serving. Mm -hmm. That means you're worshiping him. That's it. You've chosen an idol. So that part of God knows my heart, it, it cannot, it cannot, it doesn't have any ground. It doesn't wash when you don't. Your fruits don't tell it. Your, you have to have, you have to have the fruits. So Martin, the world is in a final stage of conflict between two ideologies and the, the system is beginning to get a vice grip on everybody have they been warned yes does god make sure that the people hear the warning yes uh, what about this dr martin mm -hmm. did he plainly state what is going on he warned them 10 years ago already even in in parliaments mm. and the public places it's just here it is a particularly interesting location for me to be sitting today, given that over a decade ago, I sat in this very chair right here in the European Union Parliament. And at that time, I warned the world of what was coming. I urged this body and I urged people around the world that the weaponization of nature against humanity had dire consequences. Tragically, I sit here today um, with that unfortunate line that I don't like to say, which I told you so. And in 1990, they found out that there was a problem with vaccines. They didn't work. From 1990 until 2018, every single publication concluded that coronavirus escapes the vaccine impulse because it modifies and mutates too quickly for vaccines to be effective. And since 1990 to 2018, that is the published science, ladies and gentlemen. That's following the science and not paid for by pharmaceutical companies. These are publications that are independent scientific research that shows unequivocally, including efforts of the chimera modifications made by Ralph Barrick in the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, all of them show vaccines do not work on coronavirus. Because in 2002, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, patented, and I quote, an infectious replication defective clone of coronavirus. Infectious replication defective means a weapon. It means something meant to target an individual, but not have collateral damage to other individuals. That's what infectious replication defective means. And that patent was filed in 2002 on work funded by NIAID's Anthony Fauci from 1999 to 2002. And that work patented at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill mysteriously preceded SARS 1.0 by a year. <gasps> Dave, are you suggesting that SARS 1.0 wasn't from a wet market in Wuhan? Are you suggesting it might have come from a laboratory in the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill? No, I'm not suggesting it. I'm telling you that's the facts. We engineered SARS. SARS is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. The naturally occurring phenomenon is called the common cold. It's called influenza-like illness. It's called gastroenteritis. That's the naturally occurring coronavirus. SARS 
is the research developed by humans weaponizing a life system model to actually attack human beings? And they patented it in 2002. Now, Martin, whether this Dr. Martin is legit or not is not for us to judge. He has some very interesting points. They're based on facts. The fact that he is so readily speaking at these high levels tells me there might be a reason why he's permitted to do this. Yeah. Also wears some interesting rings. Hmm. <laughs> but nevertheless... I the information is yes. there. Now, what does the information actually do? The information sows fear that someone out there is out to destroy humanity. Mm -hmm. And we need to protect ourselves against that someone out there. But the someone out there is never the one that really is the problem. No. So they don't mind front enemies. Bottom line... Did he speak for or against Fauci? Much against. Much against, right? I'm just saying Hegelian dialectic. That's it. How you put two stories in, and whether you're going to believe the one narrative or the other narrative uh, depends on your circumstances very often. Now, Martin, it's interesting to me that Dr. Martin is allowed to speak at all of these illustrious forums. Yeah, yeah. And whether I buy his narrative or don't buy his narrative is actually irrelevant. The fact is he brings some important points, but he also sows a measure of suspicion and fear mm. that someone out there is wanting to kill you. Yeah, yeah. And that someone is undefined, mm -hmm. but there is an enemy out there who wants to kill you. Is he for or against Dr. Fauci? Totally against. Totally against. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, Dr. Fauci is elevated to high levels by the Jesuit society. Yes. Now, if we understand that they are masters at the Hegelian dialectic, putting opposite views into the fray, so that they can manipulate minds and at the same time keep minds so confused that they cannot see the real picture. Yes, oh, it sucked them into be standing on a soapbox like we've always said. So our view has always been, just pull back, look at the picture and ask yourself whether it's from the left, whether it's from the right, whether it's extreme, whether it's not extreme. How does it fit into the biblical picture? Yeah. So here you have Georgetown names Dr. Anthony Fauci distinguished professor. And in his role deemed the university's highest professional honor, Fauci will participate in medical and graduate education and engage with students according to the university. We are deeply honored to welcome Dr. Anthony Fauci a dedicated public servant, humanitarian, visionary, global health leader to Georgetown University. You know, these Jesuits, <laughs> I almost said they make me sick. Um, I won't say it. <laughs> you know what? Just read this. Uh, let's just read this other part as well. Dr. Fauci has embodied the Jesuit value of being in service to others throughout his career. And we are grateful to have his expertise, strong leadership and commitment to guide the next generation of leaders. You know, it almost seems as if uh, the man is a Jesuit with a short frock. Okay, just explain to us a bit. What does that mean? Well, that's one that is incognito, that is in society, marries and okay. is part of ah, everything. But yeah, it's, it's a real... Actually, a real Jesuit. A real one. Jesuit, yes. Now, I'm not saying it is so because no. I do not know so no. because these things are obviously so secret that how could I possibly know? Even though he has acknowledged very plainly <laughs> how supportive of Jesuit theology is. Correct. So if he's so supportive and Georgetown honors him in such a fashion, but Dr. Martin denigrates him and speaks at another public forum, 
then you know what? I'm weary of all of them. Okay. Now you must also take into consideration um, Robert F. Kennedy was on Fox News primetime saying that, yes, he would actually, if it comes to that, jail Anthony Fauci. And then Rand Paul also went on because he, uh, that same Jesse Waters from Fox News, uncovered that Fauci is still um, protected, like an ex-president would be protected by Secret Service and stuff. I've watched many of these discussions where Rand Paul, you know, yeah. really attacks these people. And uh, the answers are so slippery. And no matter what the accusation is, nothing ever comes from it. No, that's so as far as I'm concerned, it's part of the Hegelian dialectic. That's exactly what I wanted to come to. So you've got the Democrat um, candidate for president. You've got the right, the conservatives. Everybody uh, is on this thing. But it's part of the Hegelian dialectic. It's part of the Hegelian dialectic. The question again, bottom line is, where is it leading? Mm. And the ultimate thing that we're trying to show is who's behind it. Yes. Who's behind it? Because these people, the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta, they're always there in the fray, in the highest echelons of leadership. And nobody looks at who they're subject to. No. The beast of revelation is who they are subject to. That beast is a control freak. That beast has a mark. And it is determined to make its mark count because that mark is contrary to God's mark. It attacks the authority of God. And we have to make a choice between accepting the authority of God for which he has set a symbol, the Sabbath, or the authority of the church for which it has set a symbol, a mark, the Sunday. That's our choice. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the world is sitting on the edge and no one seems to know. We are heading towards a precipice. Time is running out. We have a message to bear. Help us by all means with total user and listener involvement to reach the goal that you have set for your in time truth to reach the world is my prayer in Jesus name amen amen